Good evening, software engineers. It's now been a full month since I came home from Portland. I do believe I have fully embraced working from home. Mmm. Mmm. Nice peppermint tea. Help me go to sleep later. Anyway, I hope you're doing well. I hope you had a lovely day today. I hope that... Things are going well for you these last few weeks of classes. Hopefully things are going to work out well for your projects. I'm excited to see what you're doing. Um, so yeah, cool stuff, cool stuff. Let's talk about what we got going on tonight. So, today is licensing. So we're going to talk about licensing. And can you sell your project? Ooh. Did I secretly give you a way to monetize your education? Hmm? We'll find out. So, jump over to The sixth and final unit for this semester is professional issues. Um, we did a unit on each of the five phases, requirements, design, implementation, testing, and maintenance. And that leaves us with professional issues. Now, many of you have seen that 2190 has been removed from our course curriculum uh, for the BS majors. And part of that is we're trying to move some of that material here in the 3240 where it kind of makes sense. And part of it is, what does it mean to be a professional software developer? Okay, I might have to get rid of this. I was going to see if I could go the entire time with the ears on, but I'm going to keep hitting my mic. <laughs> so when we talk about professional issues, I'm going to break it down into two main categories, the legal issues and the ethical issues. Um, kind of amusing that those are separate, but let's, eh, let's not pick, nitpick there. Um, we're going to focus on um, licenses and EULAs uh, today. Um, some things such as how exactly FERPA works, how exactly HIPAA works, um, and, and what do you have to do in order to protect data, and um, what are your responsibilities there. We'll, we'll touch on a little bit, but, but mainly that's getting a little bit too specialization, uh, or too specialized. Same, similar things about like starting your, doing your own startup or entrepreneurship. I think that many of you have that drive, that desire, and that excitement. I think that's fantastic. I never really had that. I was always a, I'm going to go be a teacher which is it's, it's its own good thing. Um, but uh, I don't know a ton about that. I really don't. I have some some friends who have started companies and th that's fascinating to me. I think it's really cool. And we have courses about that at UVA and that's really cool. And I don't know much about it. So yeah. Um, same thing with human resources. Uh, I mean, I know from, from like managing TA staffs, but how do you hire people and that sort of jazz? Uh, we're not going to get into that. We're going to focus much more on what do you have to do as if you're the frontline developer sort of person as far as licensing goes. And starting on Wednesday and Thursday of this week, we're going to do ethical issues. Remember our live, whew, the live lecture on Thursday at 11. We'll see how that goes. Um, but that's the plan. All right. That's the plan. But today, licensing. Now, first off, we have to talk about copyright before we get to the notion of licensing. Specifically, well, where does it come from? It's actually copyright is built into the Constitution to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for a limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. The idea here is that basically you have the, the ability to make money off of your own ideas. So the catch when it comes to software is what does it mean to actually buy the software? I mean, you're making money off of it, right? But what are you actually buying? This could get really kind of weirdly philosophical because what you really write is the source code. So if you write the source code, what are you actually selling people? You're not selling people the source code. I mean, you might, that's a different thing, right? You might write some source code and sell people source code that then they incorporate in their own systems or you sell them source code and you're a contractor writing, you know, something that's gonna go into your system, something like that, right? 
Well, when you buy Microsoft Word or a video game or whatever, you're not getting the source code. You're getting the compiled code. You're getting something that's created from the source code, right? It's kind of like if you're a mechanical engineer, you built the machine that creates the widget. And you sell the widgets, but you built the machine. It's interesting, right? So this is why when you buy software, you're not actually buying software. You're buying permission, effectively, the license, the right, to run the compiled copy. So this is where the end user license agreement comes from. Um, you're not selling people the right to decompile your software so that then they can figure out how you made it so then they can make their own stuff. That's what the EULA is trying to protect. It's trying to protect, well, that. It's also trying to protect things like liability, like if you use the software incorrectly or something, 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 lawyers and world explodes. It's trying to prevent that as well. But really it's trying to protect you as a, as a software engineer from people decompiling um, or misusing the compiled software you sell them, the right to use that to then build their own stuff. So um, the DMCA does allow for things like reverse engineering. That's what I'm talking about here in order to make sure that the software can be incorporated into other systems. So there is kind of a loophole around that for, for good reasons. So when you buy the software, it isn't really yours, but there are people who, there was a movement in particular, the, the GNU project, GNU, GNU, let's not get in that argument, um, where the idea of selling the software really didn't feel right. And so part of the GNU project was that um, software should be free, completely free, uh, forever free. And what you are doing is you are creating something that other people are going to use and it's going to be for their benefit and therefore they should make whatever they make free also. And yeah, this this is what started the GPL, the GNU public uh, license. And the idea here is not copyright wherein you're keeping the permission to yourself. It's your right. It's your privilege to keep ownership. It's copy left, which is an amusing turn on words there. But, you know, you could think of it as you've left that, that right behind, I guess, or, or left is opposite of right. You can, you can do the play on words either way. But it's, it's very, very restrictive. The idea about it is, um, I'm going to jump a slide and come back. Uh, the idea is that um, uh, all derivative works must be released under the same license, even only if a small part uses the GPL. So imagine for a second you built, I don't know, the software that runs a router. Right? So you, you're, you're working for a company that you build a, a wireless router for, and you find a very small module, very small. 100 lines of code, 200 lines of code, something like that, that just takes care of one small problem for you. Don't know what it is, doesn't really matter, but you find it on the internet and you think, oh, this fixes my problem, this is great. I'm gonna grab this module and I'm gonna put it into the base operating system of this router. Yeah, that then effectively, if it's a GNU public license, it's a viral license, which, ooh, that has some loaded, meaning behind it nowadays but it, what that means in this case is that any software that's released that incorporates that software must also be released as a new public license and then that software is then free and then anyone else can use it for anything and then it gets gpl'd and it keeps going and going and going and the story i just told is a real one this is something that happened to a shoot it was either a it was either a netgear router or logitech had tried to make a few routers and then this happened to one of them so this was an actual case and they were taken to court and they had to release the rest of the source code. Yeah, I'm not thinking that person probably kept their job because they weren't paying attention to the licensing for the code that they incorporated in their, in their system. Now, there um, were other people who thought, wow, that GPL, that sounds great, but woo, we don't really want it to be that restrictive. We want to be able to still do stuff with our code. So it was a, a group that, you know, started with, with um, in, in the late 90s that basically said, well, we want the software to still be open source, um, but it doesn't have to be viral. And so we kind of got in these categories of whether it's free open source or commercial open source or, you know, different kind of flavorings of open source, not necessarily just 
this is open and everything else you touch from now on must now be open. So one flavor of this that came out is the MIT license. And the MIT license is probably the most liberal version of the, um, uh, of the open source licenses because basically it just boils down to anybody can use it for free. You have to include the license in the software, you know, wh whatever you're including, keep the license there, don't delete it, and don't sue us. Like, there is no warranty. So, okay, that's not too bad. There are plenty of frameworks that work under this. Uh, Ruby and, and, and Cake are a couple of these. As a matter of fact, here's the entire MIT license. Pause, read, do as you want. But you know, the software is provided as is, without warranty of any kind, expressed or implied, including but not limited to the warranties of... You can read the rest of it. Um, but you can see up there at the top, permission is hereby granted free of charge to any person obtaining a copy of the software and associated documentation files to deal in the software without restriction, including without limitation to use, copy, modify, merge, publish, distribute, sublicense, and or sell. So MIT is kind of what you want to release your code under if it, you just want to just toss it out there and you don't want to worry about anyone well hopefully suing you um and, and keep your name on it also because you want to make sure that that you you keep your you know you want to be get the recognition for doing something cool right um but you know you just put it out there now there's a middle ground between GPL, there's several middle grounds between GPL and MIT BSD is one of them uh, the BSD license basically has a set of different clauses in it and you kind of it's like a check checkbox type mentality how many of the clauses do you want do you want four three two none there's a couple different ways of them um depending on how many of the ones you include it could be somewhat compatible with different versions of gpl there are different versions of gpl um django in fact is released under the three clause bsd which looks like this redistribution of the source code must retain the above copyright notice Okay, that's kind of very MIT-like. Redistribution in binary form must reproduce the above copyright notice, this list of conditions. Um, so basically, if you if you uh, release the software in such a way that people cannot see the source code, you need to have like an about page or a help page that also prints the license. Okay, that seems reasonable. Um, neither the name of the organization nor its names may be used to endorse or promote. This one is interesting. We're going to talk a little bit about this when we look at a few of the the later um later slides but the basic idea here is if a company puts in let's say microsoft releases something and microsoft has their own license but let's just pretend microsoft releases something under the bsd license and includes this clause what that basically means is you can't put the microsoft logo on your product and says you know built with microsoft no um you you have to credit them but you can't do that you can't Im do anything that implies that there is any sort of endorsement so that's what that's getting at now turns out there are a lot of different licenses i'll give you have a second to glance at this very nice orange chart that professor bloomfield put together mm. it's very good tea so Apache has a license, Microsoft has a couple different, Mozilla has one, the BSD, the MIT. Do I expect you to know what all these licenses do? No, of course not. I expect you to know in general that you need to pay attention to the licenses, and many of them follow either the MIT, the BSD. In general, they're going to be MIT-like, BSD-like, or GPL-like. Those are kind of the heavy hitters. The ones that are listed here, Mozilla's, Microsoft's, they all branch from one of these kind of big ones. It's either copy left viral restrictive restrictive in that you have to release yours under the same license gpl not restrictive as in you can't use the software to mit's put your name on it make sure my name's still there do whatever you want to with it don't sue me so what could you do with your project i know this sounds like i'm kind of left turning here a bit but but follow me on this okay so in case you're curious if you are ever paid by the university to make something as in you're an ra um or you know you're working for its or anything where you are actually paid monetarily then the university owns that product kind of makes sense right you were paid for it but anything you create as a part of your coursework you own okay 
you own the code. It is not, it is not, oh, I created it in pursuit of my degree, so the university owns it. No. You create it in pursuit of your degree, it's yours. There are slightly more weirder rules for faculty members just because we are using more university resources. You know, we have an office at the university. We have, op we have computers are given to us by the university and to use university resources to, yeah, you can kind of see how things can get kind of weird. But for students, it's pretty clear cut, right? So it's a little bit different because you're a group project if you're looking at just your project. So technically it's joint ownership. And then of course you're gonna say, but I don't think Steve owns any of it because Steve didn't do any. Uh, technically everyone has, has some ownership rights. So y'all can hash that out as you want, okay? But if you wrote something on your own, it's yours. So, is it? Is it yours? If you remember way back at the beginning of the semester, I pointed out in the syllabus that there was a place in the citation writing down the license for any software that you included in your project. Did you see that? What license is all this released under? Can you release it? What? Well, let's go find out. If we were in class, we would do this on our own, but we can do this together as a group right here on my machine. Let's go first look at Django. Uh, we talked about that in the slides, right? Django is BSD. And so there, this is the actual Django license that is in the master branch here. They haven't touched it since 2013. Um, exactly as I showed it to you. Um, released as is, but not limited to, yada, 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 yada. Okay, Django's cool. How about Postgres? So Postgres has their own license, but it's the Postgres license, it's a liberal open source similar to BSD or MIT. As a matter of fact, um, it is just down in here. And basically it boils down to, it looks very MIT-like, except you also, they have a part in here about the University of California because that's where Postgres was created. Okay, well, that one's cool. How about we get over here and look at Bootstrap? Bootstrap is released under MIT, nice. And they even are kind enough to say it requires you to do this to keep the license and copyright notice in the CSS and JavaScript. It permits you to do all sorts of cool things like sell things, forbids you from doing these things, particularly notice these. Use any marks owned by Twitter in a way that might state or imply that Twitter endorses you. Um, it does not require you to include the source of Bootstrap itself or any modifications, which is kind of funny because it's a JavaScript library. So, I mean, it's kind of the source in its own thing. Um, but yeah, so if we look at just the kind of the baseline Django po Postgres bootstrap, you're good to go. But did you include anything else? Um, Heroku doesn't count here because Heroku is a service provider that's that's allowing you to run the software there. So that's, that's, that's different. Um, hmm. Hmm. Is there any copy left in your system? Did you go and find any piece of software anywhere that would force you to release your software under GPL? Is that gonna affect your grade in any way? No, of course not. But this is something that's really interesting to think about. You, as a professional software engineer, you can't just willy nilly go find libraries and include them in your, in your product. If it's a product that your company is gonna sell, you have to look at the license. You have to look at what you have permission to do. Can you resell this? Can you include it? Does it affect what your company will have to do if you do release it? So you got to think about these things. This is what we mean about professional issues. It's one thing to go out and, you know, scour through um, the message boards to try and find an answer to a problem. And they say, Oh, I found this, li this cool library that does it. And you're hacking things together for a school project or whatever. That's one thing. It's, it's very different when you're creating a product that's going to be sold. So there you go. Uh, that is what I have for you this evening. Um, hope you're doing well as always miss seeing you guys. Um, we had a grocery delivery today. That was exciting. It's nice to have fruit again. Um, yeah, we're trying to go every two weeks. Um, but, you know, hanging in there. 
been a month. See how things keep going. So see you around. Hopefully see you Thursday. Let me know if there's anything you want me to talk about next week. So far, the reigning suggestion in my household is Sammy would like to play Animal Crossing for you, which is adorable. Is adorable. It's adorable. Hope you're well. Ah.